Thank you so much for joining this growth support conversation. I'm your host, Neil, and today I'm joined by Andrew Rios, better known as Rios, to talk about building a support report that people will want to read. Andrew's a technologist, runner, passionate CX leader with 25 years of experience, and he has played every position on a customer experience team, built world-class support teams at startups for Fortune 100 companies such as Megapath, Fitbit, Cisco, Turntide Technologies. He's passionate about career development, and professional growth of CX leaders and teams. His off time, he's a youth sports coach and loves coaching his son's soccer and flag football teams. He lives in Southern California and enjoys spending time as much as possible he can, as he can at the beach, reading and attending live sporting events, music, and especially concerts in the park. How are you doing, Rios? Thanks. Hey, Neil, doing great. Thank, thanks for having me, man. Really looking forward to uh, chatting with you today about this topic. So. I'm really curious what you find is the best thing about Southern California. Oh man. Uh, the tacos and the beach, the tacos and the beach. It's perfect. It's perfect. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> always, always. And actually, I think it was national taco day yesterday. Um, but we're going to, we put it off one day. We're going to have tacos today. So nice uh, that note for everybody just go have a talk <laughs> <laughs> exactly so you obviously are very passionate about this topic in terms of hey let's really get the information from support teams back into the business and give companies the information that we need and the value that we have from support what do you think makes a good support report it's actionable right it, it, it not only tells a story of of um what I like to say, how you're servicing the customer, you know, how are we servicing them? It also, it's actionable about what's happening with the customer, right? Whether that's on the, the product front, whether that's on the service front, um, and it it's leading the business to improvements, whatever that may be, right? Either known, oh, we should double down and, and, and fix that known issue, or, oh, we didn't think people would really use that feature as much. We should put a little bit more behind it to, oh, that's great. That's been, we've been validated that yes, that was going to be a feature that people do use. It's all, all three areas. Um, and I think it's also in, in, in how I like to, to work them is it's personal too, right? I think it's also bringing in a dimension of this is who is servicing your customer, the team. The one thing that I like to add to the reports is a, a dimension of personalness to it. Who is the team? So highlight someone's anniversary, highlight a great piece of feedback that they got from a client or a customer. Uh, I love to love to highlight when um, a even better if is brought up by someone on the support team. I like to spotlight them, sunshine that that big action. So I think that's the what really makes it really makes it special. So it really tells a story and also gives the information to the other people within the organization to say, oh, we can actually do something with this. We can actually bring an outcome itself. Every uh, department in the organization, every team outside of CS, there's something they can extrapolate from it. Marketing, sales, development, even PR, maybe even finance and accounting, right? There's so much that happens. What I like to say is all the decisions that are made in the company are manifested uh, one way or the other in the support organization. One of the things that we've talked about before on the on the show and growth support was that we are moving from just operational metrics like hey what are, how are we actually running things efficiently to really bringing out the business outcomes uh, within these reports and within what we bring back to organizations like uh, IT tech to the product teams to say hey these are the things this is the data that we have on customers uh, what do you think is the kind of ratio or presentation that you want to put into a report that is, hey, this is how efficiently we're running things, but also these outcomes that you're talking about, if it's actionable, we can really do things with it. It's an interesting question when you say ratio, because my initial thought is it's, it's equal. It's both all the time. But then as I think back, I always talk about when you're building your report, it isn't as equal because you're doing different things. Um, so I think the ratio changes based on where you're at in the maturity of your report and the audience that's consuming it. And also uh, when that report is being uh, shared. So for example, I will use the example of 
Uh, I like to get a report out and encourage folks to do one weekly standard that covers everything. You might not be covering everything at first because you're going to build it slowly, but at, at, the, at, at some point it's going to kind of cover what you mentioned, the how we're servicing them, what's happening, and then maybe what the feedback feed forward, what's really coming out of the business. What does the data mean, right? Um, and then, but that big master report inside of it has uh, compartments that are specific to a do department. So for example, I like to keep keep a part of the report that's uh, bugs and features. Right? Let's just use those very casual words as a known issue and feature request and have that high level. Hey, here's our top five, for example, and here's what they mean, right? And then if you want to know more here, and then here's how it's impacting. Is this part of, you know, what percentage is software related? What percentage is hardware related? And then this is like, I think where people really, where you get people to love your report and want to read it is give them an action and something to look at. And that was something that a product manager back at Fitbit told me a long time ago, which was great report, great data, but there's nothing I can do with it. And we had a great conversation walking the streets and he, he educated me, he coached me on, he's like, I would love to be able to walk away with knowing I got to go look at this specifically. And here are two things that the support team said I should look at. And then they'll bring their own view and experience in as well. So that's, that's kind of the ratio and it changes. It really does change as you start and, and how you're going. But kind of to double down on that though, that big master report should have little compartments that serve different parts of the business so they can drill in and deep dive. But you're not going to have that at the beginning. I always tell people that as soon as always as I share kind of examples of reports I've done in the past, they could look overwhelming and be like, whoa, that's a lot. That's a lot of data. Who's looking? It's like this took two years to build, right? Well, this was what the first one looked like. So, And I love that you talk about the maturity of it, right? Because in a growing organization, it's moving very, very quickly in terms of, hey, we're really scaling up. We're really starting to grow this. Things are changing all of the time. And some maybe some of the things that you're measuring might change uh, there as well. And I've always found myself like, hey, this is a whole bunch of member feedback. Here you go. Uh, like, OK, this is feedback. But like, what percentage of our customers have this feedback? What's like, what's the actual quantity behind it? Because it's great that a member has this entire article and essay of member feedback of what we can do with product changes. But is it a large sum of our customers that have it and a large group when you're in the early stages say you're the only customer person at your company and you're starting to really build it out do you think that qualitative data is more important than the quantitative side of things yes yes i'm thinking back to my times so I, I, I live that right and i think that i uh it is because that's how you're going to be it is and then what you're really measuring on how you're servicing the customers, like the, the volume as you start out, when are they contacting me and how, and how often? So I know how to staff, right? I think that's the very first thing, but on the, the qualitative side, it's okay. Why are they calling us now? Right? Cause it just started, right? You only get one, you know, the first chance to make a first impression. So it just started. We just launched a product or we just launched a revision. Why are they calling us? We, we we're going to capture the, the volume and the velocity and the throughput. We got that and we'll, we'll separate that out. No problem. But why? Is it what we expected? Is it an unknown? Is it a surprise? Is it a gotcha? Um, is it a surprise in the negative way? Like, oh, we, well, we didn't expect that. We just got a rash of calls. And I think that's where you definitely want to have that. Here's how many contacts we've gotten, 100. However, 70 of them have been specifically for this. Here's what we've seen work in a workaround. Here, and this is where I encourage support teams to kind of have a product support engineer that kind of supports the team too. Here's what our PSC let us know uh, could be an indicator or something we might want to look at as they open the bug, right? And, and just kind of using that workflow and example. And then it, it kind of, yeah. it'll just balance out itself. I think though, I love that you asked that question because answering the qualitative first, right? It always and early is what gets people hooked on your report, right? And then you back it. And what I say is uh, plead your case sometimes with that quantitative data. Well, here's how much it's costing us. Here's the velocity. I'm going to have to restaff. I'm going to have to move someone around. Or, you know, I don't think I'm going to be able to get out of uh, the service metric right now for, for handle time because of this issue. However, so. That, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, because you're in early stages, like you're starting to grow and you're starting to really build it out. And your members mean a lot. 
uh, at that point. Like your customers really mean mean a lot because one, there's probably few of them, <laughs> and if you are growing to a size where there's a huge base of them, then you do have that more quantitative data side. You can say, hey, maybe seventy percent looks scary, but that's like three people or three companies. So of course, it's like <laughs> it's, it's, that's a really a lot more important on the qualitative of what they're saying because the actual like absolute number is is yeah much more you'll be able to fix that yeah you'll be able to con not control it but manage it once you kind of understand it then it's like but why are they contacting us and i always say kind of keep it really simple is it is it product related is it service related and once you categorize it you can say okay now what can we do about it is that something that we in support can just take the lead on make a change and then in, in the following report let folks know hey you'll notice that that hockey stick turned the other way it's because we did the following right yep. It's funny that you mentioned that like it's going to change, right? Your report and you're going to build it out and you're going to continue to grow. As you start to change that reporting of what you want to be able to deliver to the company, you want to look back and you want to say, okay, what was it back then? But if you don't set yourself up early to start measuring certain types of things, you won't have that information of what it was like. Is there something that you would encourage people to start doing early on to set themselves up for success for this type of reporting? Yeah, start simple. To start, start, but start simple, right? I think that uh, when you're building up a CRM, let's just assume that you get to start with the CRM at first, right? That's that's awesome. You already got a tool you get to use. So just start real simple. And what I like to say is you're kind of working backwards as well. You know you have, I, I say, we know we all have grand visions of putting out a great report that's self-serving, that's even automated, that then just, you know, but that doesn't happen from day one. So it's almost like, what do I need that first report to look like? And in, in the previous chapter, that looked like a PowerPoint slide, right? It was two slides every week that we sent out that were copies, cut and paste from our Zendesk instance reporting. We hadn't built that machine up just yet, but we had enough graphs, right? And it was just about who's contacting us and why and when, real high level categories. Then we, we knew that we were gonna learn more about the why as we took more contacts, right? So that, that first time we're setting up the, the Zendesk instance, right? It's, I'm gonna use that as an example. It's just, that's it, right? What are our operating hours? Just get that basic so you can see what's coming in. Then add another filter into it. Okay, now we know we're getting hardware, we're getting software. Okay, now what, what part of the hardware do we wanna capture in that report? How do we wanna tell that story? Always be looking in both of those directions. And then look at it week over week. Is it time to add something new? Is it time to add? And that, just ask that question. But challenge yourself monthly because there probably is something to add, right? Oh, we should now add this. Okay, now it's time to add and let the company know that um, handle time. Now we'll, I will start adding that. Because if you start throwing all those numbers out right away, you might not know what they mean just yet, especially if you get asked by outside partners in the organization. Why is the handle time so high? Why is our CSAT so low, right? Uh, CSAT is a great one to start with right away. And I keep that, I and mean, I, I know there's other conversations about effort score and NPS, but I'm just gonna look at whatever your satisfaction metric is, use that one, right? So just start with those basics again. How are we servicing that customer? And when are they coming in and contacting us? Cause you're gonna need that to your point, Neil, um, for forecasting in the future, right? And having those conversations with future staffing or future schedule changes, or uh, if you need to put an on-call program in because maybe you're seeing some some little trickle of calls coming in after hours, not worthy of putting a full-time person in or doing an outsource model just yet, maybe we just need to put an on-call program in. So that's that's kind of where, where, where I recommend. Is just start and start simple and basic, but think big picture at the end, right? And yeah, what sure. metrics matter to the business, right? What metrics matter based on the support channels you have? I think it's always interesting because also when you say, hey, yeah, this is our handle time, what you mentioned, like, hey, it's not, not like, why is it so high? Maybe that's normal. Maybe that's what our standard should be, right? If we haven't measured it before, we've never showed it to the business before, there's context around it that really matters. Uh, and the context and the story behind it is really, really important because the other stakeholders in the business don't have that context all the time because they're only seeing your report that you give them. So it's up to you to tell that story. Um, when you talk about storytelling, how can support professionals begin to speak the language of the business and build those storytelling skills around their reporting? 
put yourself in the shoes of the folks that are consuming the business, right? They're consuming the report in the business. That's, that's, you really got to put yourself in those shoes. How do they want to hear it? So listen to how they listen in meetings, right? This is where we do our homework. You listen in meetings to those partners of yours, conversate, whether it's a go to launch meeting, a bug meeting, a weekly uh, development meeting, whatever it is, an all hands meeting and hear what's important to them, right? And then that's how you want to tie your story back. So I think uh, the example I give is, you know, when we were getting, just launching a product and we had our field technicians out uh, supporting our product for the very first time, one of the most important metrics that was important to me was the, the wait time, right? I want to make sure that when a technician was out getting ready to contact us, that they got to us within 60 seconds, right? That was what was very important to me. And that's the story that I want to tell to the business, that our technicians are being taken care of, that we're on the phone with them right away. So kind of leading that instead of saying, well, they were on the phone for 11 minutes. Yeah, that's fast. That's actually a great time. You know, I, I think that's the other thing. Um, think about the product team, right? If a, a feature just launched that they're passionate about and they, they, they're really excited that it's, it's going out, it's going to make a, a difference in the market, lead when you're having conversations with that. Get them engaged, right? Get them bought in right like oh they're watching that oh yeah we're, we're taking an eye on that or we got our first few calls on that and i think um do it as real time as possible when needed too as well right if you have that relationship with folks and give them a heads up hey in this week's report we're going to be highlighting a great takeaway that we, we we got from the feature that was just released right um and then give them that heads up i think just put yourself in their shoes what's important to them too in finance Right. Hey, we were able to reduce these costs, these calls, right, by uh, putting in a, a help desk article, you know, in the email, in the auto email reply, and that helped reduce our contact by four dollars a week. I'll just use very generic numbers, right? Four dollars a week <laughs> overall. <laughs> that, that, they're, that 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 makes a guess. And I think that what happens is they'll get into the report. They also your partners walk away knowing that wow, they get it. That support leader understands, right? They understand their role, not just as servicing our customers, but bringing value to the business. And they know how to conversate with me and tell that story. And then I'll say, make it personal. Like really make it personal. You say speak the language and learn uh, a lot of, hey, let's talk, let's conversate, let's listen in these meetings. Like how do you want to be communicated with? But also the volume of information is can be quite a lot. Is there a time that you've experienced, actually, this is too much information that I gave you uh, and hasn't been, and maybe it over confused some type of situation. How'd you deal with that? Yeah, I'm smiling because I literally remember, uh, yeah, that was in a back accident in my Cisco days. I over communicated. I wanted to share, uh, uh, we had an MPI, new product launch, game changer, storage hub, media hub. And I really wanted to, to let the product team know that I knew everything that was happening out there in the field with this product and the feedback that was coming in. So um, I overwhelmed them with the data, right? And at the end, the, the engineers just kind of looked at me and go, so so is it good or is it bad? Are the customers happy or are they not happy? And I was like, God, I gave them all this information. They don't know that answer. And I, and I was early in my career, right? So luckily, uh, the director at the time, that's when I started actually getting into reporting and I got my first taste of don't bury them with a bunch of slides, a bunch of data without a reason for sharing all of that. And then he told me, what's the two things that you would want them to walk away with? That the product's awesome, it's just expensive. He goes, okay, but how are they gonna know that? And I'm like, hmm. And then it's a phrase he said, he's like, just prepare, prepare next time. Think about who's gonna be there. They don't need to see it all. And then just give them those key big takeaways and then let them read the rest after that. So that's how I've learned it afterwards. Now when teams come or, you know, PMs or, Big report, big data. It's like, okay, you got two minutes with them. You got two minutes when it comes to your time in the meeting. What do you want them to walk away with? Everything. No, they can't. Two things. Two things. Is it something that they can go away with um, to, to improve the product? Is it something they can go away with, let the product team know we, we hit it? Is it something in the finance side? Is it something for sales to understand? Is it, is it something for IT to understand? Right? Like, you know, so that that's... Yeah. <laughs> and and you, you got to have, it's got to happen once so it never happens again. <laughs> <laughs> That's the learning moment, right? When you, when you're like, oh, oh, actually, uh, no, but I really just wanted you to get this information out of it. The, this, this specific thing, you guys are doing great. Yeah. 
like that's it <laughs> exactly. for teams that like we communicate in our company as a smaller organization of about 80 people now we have dedicated channel for hey this is member feedback this is customer feedback let's share it all the time let's be consistent with it it's let's get a good mix you know good uh constructive let's let's start really sharing it and really raising that customer experience for everybody to see uh in there as well and we would really try to communicate on a regular basis uh, so that everybody has information, kind of knows what's going on. And well, there's always continuous conversations happening everywhere. When you talk about doing a weekly report and you're continuously doing this, how often do you see that those changes actually get actions on the, a weekly basis? Or are you putting out a weekly report and then maybe one of the changes takes three, four months to implement or change? Do you keep reporting on that or are you changing those? Yeah. Yeah. Um there are a couple of questions there. I love that. It's uh, so weekly, right? It's the highlights of the week, right? It's the, the entire report. So if the previous week, uh, there's a, if the, if the following week, there's an update on a previous week's highlight that's worthy of everyone knowing about. Like for example, uh, last week we reported that uh, feature request 2727 was requested by X customer. Uh, this week development has moved it to planning and they believe that this feature will be released in Q3, right? So now, because that's living in JIRA, the report has given the business the update. Now that in, that specific issue is being worked in, in JIRA. So I like what you said earlier, that's the history pattern. So now you can go back and go, oh, okay. Oh, so the report, so two weeks later. And then um, you can then, and I, I love that question because when you do your end of year summary, it becomes so easy to just look at those reports and go, ooh, we, we bubbled up 17 feature requests and they took action on 14 of them. And of those 14, five are live now with five getting set to be live in, in, in Q1 of next year. That right there is a great victory, right? For and, 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 and sign of collaboration for the whole company to see and enjoy together. And I always say like, always lead your report with as much positiveness as possible. Because yes, in support, we see all, all of it. Right. And, and, and if the, everything is perfect, there would be no support. Right. But always lead it with the most positive as possible, because then they'll listen to you when you do bring something up. Right. Um, and then I'll, I'll say something there, too, that, 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 that I'm remembering now, Neil, since you mentioned that question is um, sometimes you're putting something in a report that, you know, isn't going to be worked on right now and, you know, is not a priority. But that doesn't mean you don't put it on. And that doesn't mean also that you just pound on it every week. But it doesn't mean you set it and forget it. What it means is you say, OK, right now, that's not going to be a priority for the business. One day it might be. And I'll use an example of, um, you know, uh, I went through a reduction in force at one of my previous companies a couple of rounds. And what I was able to do then with the previous data and reporting when my staff shrunk and, and SLAs and metrics were all out the window, right, was go back and say, look, if we do the following to our product, this is the amount of calls that are no longer happening. I don't need to staff backfill that many folks. So what you're doing is you're also, it's a game, of, the report is kind of like a game of chess too. You're saying, okay, no problem, I got it. It's documented. And I have a phrase I use, which is, it's not documented, it never happened. But then you'll have an opportunity later to go back and go, oh, we got enough data. And since we've been tracking it, and I think that's that's where I'll, I'll go on a small little sidebar of that's where you got to let your support teams know, you know, they don't always take action on everything, but we got to keep tracking the impact on something and not use the line of, well, they're not going to fix it, so who cares? Nope, wrong attitude. The attitude is, hey, Neil just called in on bug 7575. You know what? I'm going to add him to the impacted list. So now we have 13 clients impacted, now 14, now 15. That's the other part of the report that's happening too, behind the scenes, right? It's continuing to manifest data and the story. And that's going to breed business outcomes, right? Because then you're, hey, this has been a building issue for quite a long time. This is the impact over time. We have the measurements. We have the the actual success and the data to back it up that this is an actual should be a priority product change. Let's core fix this so that we can staff appropriately so that we don't need to backfill or just 
throw bodies at it because that's going to be really expensive for the organization. And, you know, if support is already an operational center that we're really trying to become much more strategic, reducing body count and costs for the company is going to go a really long way, right? Yeah, efficiency, right? Efficiency is, is what it's all about. I think that your reporting, and Ali, that's that's another area where your reporting helps you tell that story, right? And then that way, if someone says, well, why does that happen? Why does it take so long? Well, this is why, right? I think it, your reporting can also tell you some of the, and I say with tough love, right? We're all, we're all in it together, right? But I say it like, um, uh, why don't we have a complete story for this issue, right? And it's like, well, because we don't have all the data to go do that issue, to work that issue. Well, why don't we? Because we just don't have that data. And that's, I mean, and then we have the conversation. Well, why? And I think that reporting can also help the company with data hygiene to understand like, oh, that's as much of the story as we're going to get. Yeah, that's as much of the story as we're going to get. Well, how can we get more? That actually has to happen in the onboarding phase, right? Or that has to happen on, so, or the implementation phase. So the biggest things for people who want to make a support report that people want to read and want to love to read start simple make it actionable stay positive and gather the information so that you can really start to bring it forward and i think the most important part is tell a story to the audience who needs to hear it right yeah exactly right exactly and sometimes that's brutal honesty Right. We we thought we right. I always like to say we as an organization, as a team, as a company thought that this feature was going to be the game changer. It turns out and the way we designed it, we thought it was going to be. However, the truth is, based on what we're hearing and talking about. This is actually what the clients and customers are saying. And then I think another thing I like to do is say with the report, you get to get folks involved. Right. Then you can kind of maybe welcome them in. If they want to learn more. So come on in, listen to a call. Come on in, I'll have you sit side by side with one of my support engineers as they, they work in escalation. Right, I think the report is also kind of a gateway in to the organization. You can kind of like, it's like a curtain. You can say, well, but what else is happening back there? Right, like, well, there's a lot more. Let me tell you, you know, we take a thousand calls a week, you know, so. Yeah, <laughs> I love it, I love it. Th thank you so much. I, re I really appreciate you sharing your insights and and really helping other people to build this really reporting and the insights for them. Uh, to wrap things up, I have one more question that I'd love to ask. Yeah. What's one thing throughout your support journey that has been extremely impactful or has stuck with you throughout the entire time that you still look back at? Yeah, that's... um. And say this because that's an it's an easy one, but I'm taking myself back to those times. Um, a a director of mine early in my career as a PM, as I was making the shift from individual contributor to to uh, manager, direct manager, managing individuals, people, manager. Um, he said the phrase when I was in a meeting with other leaders in the company. And it, it got political. And um, I've learned that that day that I'm not a political person. I'm a customer service guy. I'm a, this is what we deal with here. How we are. I like to do it with a smile. I'm positive. Uh, and, but I suggested to him kind of a way to navigate that politics too. Now, also, he was a director, right? He's more experienced than I, but I wanted to help him out a little bit. And he looked at me and gave me, he said, hey, that's, we could do that. And he said it like this. He said, we can do that, Andrew. He's like, however, I stay on the high road. I want you to always stay on the high road. Sometimes that road is, is lonely. Sometimes that road can be rough emotionally, but if you stay on the high road, I promise you will always get to the top of the mountain and then get down the other side a lot gradually. And that stuck with me then. And, and from that moment on, I, I never got into any kind of politicking at all. It was always just, what are the facts? What do they mean? What are we gonna do about it? And that was actually the conversation. He ended it with that. He's like, so I'm going to introduce you to this phrase, Andrew. What are the facts? What do they mean? What are we going to do about it? And that that right there, if anybody's ever worked with me before, they know that they hear that from me regularly. And that's how I like to coach, right, is, is with that kind of mentality. And, you know, 
skip post Cisco systems. Thanks for that. Cause that changed, that changed my life and allowed me to sit here and talk with you today, Neil. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate it. And I, I think from your personality and everything that we see, I can, we can really sense that as well. Thank, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming out and, and sharing and, and talking to me as well. And I, I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day and move forward from there. You too, Neil. It's been an honor. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll see you on the internet and everybody do good. All right. Be well. Thank you so much.